Uh, thank you all for having me. My name is Josh DiPaolo, and I am the wildlife naturalist at Rockefeller State Park Preserve. For those that don't know the preserve, it's located within Pleasantville in Westchester County, and it's about 1,700 in acres of size or so. And within that acreage is encompassed a variety of different habitats. You have deciduous forests. We have some remnants of evergreen forests, but not too much of that. We have grasslands, riparian ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, and things like that. But embedded within those ecosystems, we have a multitude of different wildlife that utilize them for habitat. And I'd be glad to talk all night about the biodiversity and fauna at the preserve, but tonight it's a bird talk, so we're going to talk about bird and bird conservation. So that's what I'll focus on. But before I give any talk, I always just like to state two things right off the bat, and that is one, what exactly am I going to be talking about? And two, about how long is this going to take? And I promise I will not keep you all night. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes or so talking about these following topics. And simply put, I want to just first address some changes to some of our land management practices with regards to grasslands in particular and how that kind of translates into bird conservation. In addition to that, I want to talk about some relatively new bird monitoring initiatives within a particular grassland in a particular part of the preserve called Rockwood Hall. And that's because we put a lot of time and resources into improving habitat there lately. And then lately, or I should say in addition to that, I just want to make some quick plugs on some other notable wildlife observations and projects because I don't think I'd be doing the preserve justice if I just focused on birds, but I'll do some quick mentioning on them as well too. So with that being said, land management practices. This is how I want to do this with this crazy looking map here, which I promise I'll summarize in just a second, but essentially this is an overhead view of the preserve proper, so to speak, and all of the different highlighted areas are the habitats within the preserve, and they've essentially been rated in terms of quality from best to worst. And the punchline here is those habitats that are in red and then have the letter D on them, that got a bad grade, so to speak, these are the worst quality habitats within the preserve due to a variety of factors which I can talk about. And there's a few of them, right? But if you focus on the top left of the screen, you'll see this pretty large outlined area. This is called Rockwood Hall. It's about 400 acres in size. And that puts it at about 20% of the preserve's overall acreage, but it has just about a quarter of the preserve's overall grassland habitat. And what you see here is that not much of this grassland habitat, not much of the habitat at all really is rated in terms of habitat quality because it's not really been viable habitat for quite some time. And that's a concern to us, right? Because especially with regards to grasslands, they're arguably one of the most sensitive ecosystems, not only in the preserve, but perhaps across the continental United States as well, too. And I think it's something like 60% of grasslands over the past 100 years or so have either been severely degraded or have disappeared altogether. And so that's important for us to change, especially because such a representative portion of the preserve has grasslands, which could be providing utility to a lot of wildlife, but maybe are not doing as much as they should due to historical practices, which I'll talk about. So ideally, we would like for all of our grasslands and fields to kind of look like this. This is an example of one of our better fields still under state management. This is Overlook Trail. And the, the history with Rockwood Hall is that historically, it's been a very aesthetically pleasing place, so to speak. And the fields were well manicured, and that was achieved by frequent mowing. And while that's aesthetically pleasing, that compromises the integrity of the grassland to an extent, right? And so to somewhat improve this extant but dwindling habitat, we've adjusted several of our land management practices with the help from a number of people. And the first adjustment that we, we've made is that we no longer perform systematic mowing of any fields between mid-May through about mid-August. That's because the, that's the peak activity for a variety of obligate and facultative grassland birds, whether it's 
just arriving, foraging, nest building, fledgling, and all that stuff. But not just birds, a variety of other wildlife are quite active during that period too. So mowing, mowing can be a helpful tool in terms of grassland management, but if you don't do it at a correct time, it can be severely destabilizing to this ecosystem, which is why we've moved outside of that period. But in addition to that, if we do mow a field, we do our best not to do so more than once or twice per year maximum to limit the frequency of disturbance to this area. And in addition to that, if we do decide to cut a field, we do our best not to cut more than 50% of a contiguous field at a given time. And the thought process with that is, if you go ahead and cut a field, half of it, inevitably, there will probably be some collateral damage, so to speak. Wildlife may be displaced or disturbed, but if you leave the other contiguous immediate proximate half intact, that could serve as an immediate wildlife relief area to mitigate some of that damage. And so it's, it's going to take a while to improve these grasslands at Rockwood Hall due to historical practices, but we are seeing some improvements. And under this paradigm, We've no, not only aimed to improve the quality of grassland habitat, but also to facilitate another dwindling habitat within this particular part of the preserve. And that is habitat for cavity nesting birds, which as most of you know, and as the name suggests, these are birds that essentially rely on the cavities or holes in old standing mature trees for nesting opportunities. The place with, or I should say the problem with Rockwood Hall is that a lot of these older standing trees as they fall are unfortunately replaced by mostly herbaceous and woody invasive vegetation that does not replicate the same qualities of native trees. And so a lot of that, that cavity nesting opportunity is lost because there's a heavy invasive seed bank at Rockwood Hall. So to give these birds a bit of a leg up or a wing up, so to speak, we've installed about 26 nest boxes at Rockwood Hall over the past two years or so. And about 12 of these boxes are meant to attract purple martins. 13 of them, I'd say, are more to attract smaller passerine birds, such as eastern bluebirds, tree swallows, to an extent house wrens and other birds do use them. But also we work together in joint partnership with Stone Barns to Think of a prototype American Kestrel box that you can telescope into the air at the appropriate heights in which they like to nest. And we've installed one of them at Buttermilk Hill, which is by Stone Barn Center, but also we've installed one at Rockwood Hall as well now too. Since we've put these boxes in place, in addition to the grassland management, I think this has been the best year we've had so far in terms of productivity. And with regards to productivity, maybe one of the best places to start is perhaps with one of the most charismatic and unusual and gregarious birds you might find at Rockwood Hall, in my opinion, and that is the, the purple martin. But to talk about their nesting activity, I just want to spend maybe a minute talking about their behavioral ecology, because this is one of the few symbiotic relationships between people and wildlife that I'm familiar with, where both people and wildlife are benefiting to an extent from this reaction or this interaction. And for the most part, when people interact with wildlife, usually it's at the detriment to wildlife, right? But this goes all the way back to indigenous times and early colonial settlers that were still somewhat farming the land sustainably, you know, a couple hundred years ago and whatnot. And what they figured out back then was if they were to hang gourds or squash by their crop fields, these weird birds would move into them, right? And so that's a benefit for the bird. It gets a free home. But also at the same time, these purple martins, they're insectivores primarily. So they provide a service to an extent to these farmers in return because they're consuming the insects that would otherwise be, uh, you know, causing damage to their crops. And so that relationship has persisted for quite some time. And now, to my knowledge, east of the Mississippi River, I believe purple martins nest almost exclusively in these human-provided boxes, which is why you see most martin boxes look like these squashes hanging in the air. 
But with regards to productivity at Rockwood Hall, we currently have five active nests there, of which is currently holding about 22 hatchlings. And we believe they're going to fledge in maybe the next week and a half or so. Purple Martins have a pretty drawn out fledge period. It's almost a month. I think it's about 26 days. I might be wrong on that. But uh, we're hoping that they're going to fledge probably in the next week, week and a half. In addition to that, we have just experienced our second arrival of purple martins. And for those that are familiar with them, they kind of migrate in two waves, right? You have the the more mature adults, the scouts come earlier in the spring, and then you have the sub-adults or less mature adults come usually by May, but for some reason, they always come a bit late at Rockwood Hall each year that we've had them. So we started seeing them a few weeks back and hopefully we'll have some additional nests in addition to what is currently there, which will put us at our best year so far for them. All right, so I think I also mentioned in addition to the Martin boxes, we have some other smaller passerine boxes. And for the most part, what takes to them is the bluebirds and the tree swallows. And thus far at this particular part of the preserve, it's been our best year so far for bluebirds. We've had four successful nests, of which have yielded 17 fledglings. We did have one failed nest earlier in the season, but I believe that is mostly attributed to interspecies competition. And the backstory with that, not that it matters, I suppose, is these bluebirds came in early in the spring. They dropped a clutch of eggs. They were incubating. And you had some very ambitious tree swallows that came in and did not want to give up this box. So they pretty much built their nest directly on top of it and kicked out the bluebirds. But just as of last week, we got a brand new clutch of bluebird eggs. It's not so late in the season that it's unusual, but that was an unexpected and pleasant surprise. So hopefully more fledglings to come with that. And tree swallows are doing just fine at Rockwood Hall, as they always have. We've had five successful nests, of which have yielded 19 fledglings so far. And across the tree swallows, bluebirds, and purple martins, this has been our best year since we put in these relatively new nest boxes. So we're quite happy with that over a short period of time. So... I believe I also mentioned we put in some Kestrel boxes too. We have one by Stone Barn Center and we have one at Rockwood Hall. And we tried to place these boxes in strategic areas that were already within Kestrel utility. So whether it's foraging grounds, migratory stopovers, so they were well positioned and we worked in joint partnership with Stone Barns to do this. We've been a fantastic help with this. And at least with the box at Rockwood Hall, Early in the season, in the spring, we did see a Kestrel perch on top, go inside and come out of this box. And we were quite excited and hopeful that there would be a nesting attempt. But instead of the Kestrels, what decided to move in is what you see here on this right-hand side, these uh, very ambitious falcon wannabes. These are tree swallows, which most of you can probably tell hatchlings as by the collection of different bird feathers, which are used to bed the nest. And... That's just fine to us. We would much rather see a native species of bird use this as habitat rather than be it vacant or used by a non-native species. And presumably if the kestrels did want to move in, I assume they'd have no problem kicking the tree swallows out. But I want to make a point to say that it's it's quite important to us to think about how to better provide habitat to kestrels because as most of you probably know, over the past few decades, maybe longer, they've taken a pretty hard hit in terms of their population and we're starting to see some improvements but through a collection of habitat loss and the inadvertent ingestion of pesticides grass kestrels being quite familiar and liking to use the utility of grasslands and consuming invertebrates if private landowners put pesticides down on a field or even farms use them the kestrels consume that exposed invertebrate and that does compromise their reproductive success amongst other things. So hopefully soon we'll not only have foraging and migration grounds, but hopefully nesting opportunities and habitat too. So I, I thought about this and I felt like it was better to include it. I just want to switch gears in talking about bird productivity and talk a little bit about bird mortality. Um, with specific regard to this HPAI, this highly pathogenic avian influenza, or which we can just call this new strain of a bird flu at the moment. And 
New York state is considered an impacted state from this bird flu across a few different categories, namely domestic poultry to an extent passerine birds, but that has limited concerns associated with it for reasons we can talk about with my limited knowledge of that. But there is also some growing but concerning evidence that mammals which ingest infected birds can also become infected. So we're keeping a close eye on this. And I've just listed out some of the mortalities I personally encountered at the preserve this season. There's been nothing terribly suspicious so far, but to be prudent and conservative, anything suspicious we are reporting to the USGS and DEC. The only weird one on this list, I know that's a dead tree swallow on the right, but the one weird one that I did encounter was a dead adult, relatively healthy looking purple martin inside the nest box, which I found dead early in the season, and it was fully intact. Its keel was not emaciated, so it didn't seem like there was a nutrition concern associated with it. And I kind of had in mind that these birds were big enough and resilient enough to endure the battering from, you know, the usual culprits, house sparrows or even tree swallows can get fairly aggressive and kill some birds from what I've seen. But we are doing our best to just stay on top of this and monitor it. And I want to encourage anybody that frequents the park, if they do see anything unusual, whether it's bird mortality, behavior, or even other wildlife, please do let us know. I will give you my personal contact information at the end of the call so we can just help keep a better eye on this thing. So turning the bend here, I feel like I wouldn't, or I should say I would be making the other wildlife jealous at the preserve if I didn't at least briefly talk about them as well too. So we've been performing a variety of different wildlife monitoring initiatives. And one of them, if you focus on the left-hand side, is we've been doing extensive camera trap surveys on sensitive or under-surveyed species. But one of the things we're finding is we seem to have a relatively healthy population of meso predators or middle-sized predators, and that would include things such as bobcats and coyotes. And I know these animals are typically associated with negative connotations, but they are incredibly important to our ecosystems, and it's very important to have them here. And if anybody wants to talk more about this afterwards, if you have any concerns, especially with regards to coyotes, I know there's been growing concerned with their presence lately there, I'd be glad to talk about that. Switching gears though, over to the right-hand side, we have been putting a lot more resources into investigating and studying and monitor relatively under-surveyed taxa, such as amphibians and reptiles. And one of the projects we're working on that we're putting a lot of resources into is resuming our aquatic turtle survey. We did Ferguson Lake last year. We're doing Swan Lake again this year for a second time. And the main question we're asking with this study, uh, which is always important to ask, what's the point of you disturbing these animals potentially, is one, we want to see what the biodiversity or the health and the biodiversity are of our native turtles in these water bodies. And an example of that would be this really skinny, flat looking turtle on the right hand side. This is what I believe is probably a male painted turtle. And so we have that species amongst various others in these bodies of water. But we also want to keep an eye on non-native species, such as this big one in the center, this beautiful but bulbous looking yellow belly slider that's hogging a lot of the basking areas. This was probably somebody's pet that was released at the preserve many years ago. They're a very common pet store turtle. Um, and hopefully through continued efforts and monitoring this, we'll get a good idea on the balance between native and non-native species and if any conservation plans need to be implemented as a result of that. So that's kind of a high gloss over this other wildlife area. If any of this is interesting, let me know. We have plenty of time to talk after, I believe. But I want to kind of near this to an end and, and say a very sincere and special thanks to a variety of individuals because without the help of these individuals, grassland conservation within the preserve would not be what it is today and bird conservation would also not be there too. So special thanks to Ann Swain and Sandy Morrissey of the Audubon Society 
as well as Dr. Elijah Goodwin, who is the senior ecologist and in-house ornithologist at Stone Barn Center. In addition to that, I just want to make a quick plug on Feed the Birds from Croton on the Hudson. A majority of the nest boxes we've installed at Rockwood Hall came from there, and they're a great resource for backyard birding materials as well as other wildlife materials. And just lastly, also a quick thanks to Robert Amendola, one of our volunteer wildlife photographers, who if you've enjoyed a lot of these epic shots you've seen in the presentation, most have come from him, including this of the double-crested cormorants here. I argue Robert probably does a better job at documenting the biodiversity of wildlife in the preserve than I do. So thank you to all these people. And this is my contact information at the bottom left. If you see anything that is interesting or concerning, don't be shy. Please reach out. I'm usually pretty good about getting back to folks the same day via email. So that's it for me. And thank you for your time. And let me know if there's any questions.